Welcome to Mokina's Front Porch, a Mokina history podcast with Matt Gaelic and me, Israel Smith. All right, Matt, this week we are talking about the history of the Cooper and Hostert Ford Agency of Mokina. So I'm sure a lot of people didn't even know that Mokina had a Ford agency right. back at a time. Oh, it did all right. Um, yeah. And where was that? So the the agency, the the office, the garage, the whole kit and caboodle all in one building there was on the north side of Front Street where Avalanche Jewelry is nowadays. And in the, I guess that would be the western side of the building, there's the office for the uh, U-Hauls mm-hmm. and uh, that sort of thing. Yeah, right right where that building stands nowadays is where Cooper and Hoster used to be. And that was the whole the whole footprint of the dealership was kind of what that building where that building sits now. Is that yep, right? Yep, that is correct. That is correct. Uh as we'll see, when Cooper and Hostert first started, they were in a separate, much smaller building that was directly north of there that actually fronted on First Street. Uh, oh wow. Yeah, yeah. And what kind of uh what kind of cars you know were we talking about at this time? Uh, just like when they first got started, the Model T would have been what they were selling and uh, dealing in. I believe the first car they sold was a Model T. And mm-hmm. uh, later on, they just carried whatever Ford was producing. And uh, they also, uh, interestingly, sold uh, Ford tractors as well. Wow. As we went on showing the agricultural uh, environment in which Mokina was living at the time. All those years. This is a story that includes, um, you know, uh, World War One, sure, and we have yeah. you know one of the partners going off, and how that affects the business, um, and even till uh, you know people that were connected to it today. We were just talking a little bit about uh, Mr. Dave Bergman sure, in town yeah. here, who I'm, I'm sure a lot. Of, it seems like a lot of people know, and, and oh, he got his. Yeah. You know, as you say, you got his start there, and he got his start working at uh, working at Cooper and Hostert, uh back in the. Oh, don't quote me. I can't remember off off the top of my head when exactly he started working there, but he was a trusted, uh, valued uh, employee of Cooper and Hostert for yeah for a long time. He, so hopefully, we'll get a chance to talk to him and be. I, I, I hope think so. Add some interesting uh, color to this story as well. Oh sure. And this yeah. this is not the first time we've talked about uh, the Cooper Hostert. Uh, Ford agency, we our Christmas special. Oh, yeah, we that's had right. Santa Claus visited the the d- agency. Sure, he did. There, yeah, right? he and did. then also in the episodes about your book, the Overland Park Murder Mystery. That's correct. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, Barney Hostert uh, played a large role in in that story. Yes, he did. All right. Yeah. So uh, very interesting. So it'd be it's uh, you know now we kind of get the backstory. We get to hear. Uh, where they were before uh, Santa Claus came to town right, and, yeah. and after. So let's get into the story. Let's, absolutely. The automobile is an integral part of American life. From getting to and from work or school or even taking a road trip cross country, it's impossible to imagine our lives without cars. And nothing says American auto like Ford. An old company with 118 years already under its belt, it should only be natural that such a time-honored concern would have a long-seated connection with Mokina, one of the oldest communities in Northeast Illinois. Founded in 1916, the Cooper and Hostert Ford Agency was famous not just in Mokina, the community it called home for decades, but throughout the wide expanse of greater Will County. Going all the way back to the start of this illustrious village business, tracing the roots through the years like a family tree, we come to the two men who started it all, Elmer Cooper and Barney Hostert. The scion of a deep-rooted Orland family, Elmer Lucerne Cooper was born in that locale on July 14, 1879. As a tiny one-and-a-half-year-old, he, his parents, and brother moved to a farm at the far southern edge of the township, about two miles north of Mokina, at what is today Wolf Road and 179th Street. There Elmer came of age, a boy amongst rural and agricultural surroundings, attending school in the nearby one-room Maui schoolhouse. He married 21-year-old Ella Caroline Lawfer, the daughter of a well-established Homer Township family, in February 1902, at which time the couple moved to Goodland, Indiana, 
where they farmed for around five years. During the Coopers' sojourn in the Hoosier state, they also welcomed two children to the world, Florence and Harold. Ultimately, coming back to this neck of the woods, the young family rented a farm belonging to Mokina's crop family, having stood a few yards north of today's intersection of Wolf Road and Route 6. Tilling the soil at this spot was no easy task. Elmer began to seek help with the job and came to hire Barney Hostert, who moved in with the family. First recorded living with the Coopers by a census taker in 1910, Hostert was a 19-year-old native of Homer Township. Having forged a bond under the hard work of a farmer's lot, the dream of private enterprise loomed large for these two entrepreneurs. This pair of men, who had come to shine so prominently in Mokina's history, set about to open the first garage and auto dealership in the village. What led the partnership to enter this burgeoning business cannot be reconstructed through the fog of time, but it is known that the two pooled their resources and constructed a brand new building in town to serve as their headquarters. Located immediately north of the sprawling Mokina Hall on Front Street, the new structure facing First Street was the storefront of the Cooper & Hostard Ford Agency, their doors opening for the first time on Thursday, September 21st, 1916. In assembling their staff, Fred Hench, a young Mokina resident, was taken on as a mechanic. Rounding out the shop, the new firm also had permission from the village board to set up a gas tank in front of their building. The new business didn't have to wait long for its inaugural customer. On their first day, the car of George Mager, a local farmer, happened to break down nearby, and he received prompt service at the garage. So impressed was he by his treatment that Mager remained a steadfast customer 30 years later. The agency made its first auto sale to Charles Lease, a Mokina baker and village trustee. He bought a 1916 Model T Ford that cost him $360. In this era, new cars for sale were shipped to the village via the Rock Island Railroad, and they arrived CKD, or completely knocked down, meaning that each vehicle arrived over the rails in pieces, which were then built by Cooper and Hostert in the garage on 1st Street. Reflecting the rural atmosphere that was Mokina in their time, the agency also sold Ford tractors as well. At the very beginning, it would be remembered that patronage was good and business increased. With things going so swiftly, an obstacle reared its head that nearly derailed everything. The Cooper and Hostert Ford agency started business at a time when the world was in great unrest, with World War I raging in Europe. The United States entered the fray less than a year after the concern opened up shop, and Barney Hostert was summoned for service in the Army in 1918. Completing a soldier's training, the war ended before he could get to it, sparing him the horrors of combat. When Barney was away, Elmer Cooper carried on business affairs by himself, all the while being earnestly helped by his worthy assistant, none other than his 13-year-old son, Harold. Almost 30 years later, the Coopers looked back fondly and said that, boys will be boys, and at a certain age, they all seemed to know a great deal. So father and son had many interesting moments in making decisions. With the war over, Barney Hostard came back to his business in Mokina and promptly married Viola Lawfer, the younger sister of Ella Cooper, around 1919. Together, they had five children, namely Bernice, Charles, Eleanor, Arthur, and Norma, all of whose names are still well-known in community circles to this day. In 1920, Cooper and Hostert were so busy that they had sold 67 cars in the first six months of that year. Commerce hummed along at such a pace that their little building on 1st Street was bursting at the seams. And so it was that the firm bought its neighbor immediately to the south, the old Mokina Hall, in the summer of 1923. They didn't have to work too much on converting the rambling building into a garage and auto dealership, as their previous tenants, the partnership of Hench Brothers, had previously had a go in the business there, specializing in Chandler's, Chevrolet's, and Rio trucks. Once Cooper and Hostert got settled into the Front Street building, 
They retained ownership over the previous workspace just behind the building, converting it into a place for storage. As a sign of his stature in the village, in 1928, Elmer Cooper was called one of the enterprising and progressive businessmen of Mokina. A well-respected local enterprise, combined with a prominent location in town, led the garage to become a social focal point for the community, even serving as something like an informal city hall. For decades, the building served as a polling place, not to mention the bench in front of the building that was a gathering spot for villagers who came to gossip, discuss, and cuss local politics and everything in between. Elmer Cooper's granddaughter, Dolores Barents, remembers the garage's work area being open to any who visited and that it was a meeting place for men during the day. If no cars were in the showroom, the youth of Mokina's Methodist Church, of which the Coopers were active members, would use it as a meeting place. The showroom was also the site of many a successful bake sale by the Methodist ladies, usually held about once a month on Saturdays. All of this combined activity made the building busy as a beehive on Front Street. So in the blog post, this is where the you posted a picture. And this is a picture, again, yeah. we're very familiar with. Uh, it covers, uh, it's on the cover of your book, yeah, The yeah. Orland Park Murder Mystery. Absolutely. Yeah. So maybe just talk about, one, why, uh, why you like this picture so much or why you... Yeah. Used it, and what's what's going on here? Yeah, it's a really cool picture. Uh, first of all, one of the reasons I like it so much is because it's not just a plain picture of a building. There's all this commotion and activity and people gathered around. And what we have sort of at the forefront of the picture are uh, Elmer Cooper on the left and Barney Hostard on the right sitting on the fender of a car I could imagine was a Ford. And uh, next to them, you can kind of see to their right or to our right, looking at the picture, you can kind of see like the stripped down skeleton of a car next to them. And what's going on in that picture is that car that's next to them was used in a form of polo played using cars that were stripped down like this. Uh, And the playing field was uh, out uh, pretty close to Marley actually. So I'd like to think maybe a game had just ended and everyone was gathering back at the garage, or maybe they were seeing some of the players as it were off to go start a game or something like that. But yeah, there's a, there's just a lot of flavor in the picture and I think it's a pretty good one. Yeah. And what buildings uh, do we see in the background? Do you know? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, if you look at the picture on the left, you can see just a tiny little sliver of the Cooper and Hastert garage or Ford agency, as it were, uh, the next building that's sort of kind of, uh, I guess you could say directly above Elmer Cooper in that picture was a building that was owned for decades and decades and decades by the Stillwagon family that, uh, at the time of that picture was probably vacant. Uh, the properties, the, um, Stillwagons owned a couple of neighboring buildings, That were actually the neighbors to the Cooper and Hostert garage on the east. And they were kind of derelict and kind of run down and caused a lot of problems in town uh, for a lot of years. But you can can kind of prominently see the one there. And uh, if you look at the right of the picture, well, kind of in the first of all, in the middle of the picture, you can kind of see our old water tower sticking out there a little bit uh, behind some trees and uh, which stood from. From 1898 to 19. See, I wouldn't even notice that. Oh, yeah. really? I, I didn't know. I wouldn't have picked it out from the, the tree there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So good to know. See, that's why it's an audio podcast, but we still talk about pictures. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> why. It's a good picture. Yeah. It is. It's a great picture. It's a lot going on there. Yeah. And in the, uh, finally, on the, uh, sort of the right side of the picture above some of the bystanders there, you can see the old uh, historic building that now houses uh, the, uh, uh, dog groomers on the uh, south side of uh, Front Street. Sure, yeah. Which uh, at that time, at the time this picture was taken, uh, it had formerly been the Rinky Butcher Shop, and uh, before the or no, a little after that, World War One years, it was the Lease Bakery. That's where uh, Charles Lease's bakery was, who was a uh, early customer of Cooper and Hostert. 
Uh, I have to get back to you on what was in the building at the time this picture was taken. No, that's really? uh, but this is a great picture. I mean, you can see why, uh, you know, you used it in the book. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Again, yeah, a lot of action. So make sure if you're listening that you check out the the blog posts so you can see these really cool pictures. And there's more in here as well that we're not necessarily stopping to talk about. But yeah, yeah. that one being so prominent, I uh, thought it was a good idea. Mokini and Dave Bergman, who started working for Cooper and Hostard in 1953, has many fond memories of Elmer Cooper, describing him as a great guy, a super guy, and as someone who was never known to visibly get mad. Dolores Behrens says that he was a gentleman, very outgoing, generous, and community-minded. Both he and Barney Hostert were the types who would help anyone in need. Barney had the interests of Mokina foremost in his mind, and was always known to have a characteristic plug of tobacco in his mouth. The two proprietors wore many hats around town, the compiled list of which is impressive. Elmer Cooper became a director in Mokina School District 159 in 1924, a post he held for 30 years, not to mention his later seat as treasurer of the Mokina Chamber of Commerce and involvement with the Mokina Lions Club. Aside from these local organizations, Elmer also worked for the Will County Health Department as an investigator in the 1940s and was a Republican precinct committeeman for many years. Both Elmer Cooper and Barney Hustert were active with the village's chapter of the Modern Woodman, a fraternal organization that claimed a high membership in this area. Barney gave countless hours of his time to the Mokina Volunteer Fire Department, where he was appointed assistant chief in 1932. As a young man, Elmer Cooper's aforementioned son, Harold, received an education at the Ford factory in all the workings of their vehicles and came to join his family's business as chief mechanic while also working as the firm's bookkeeper. In the fall of 1946, the Cooper and Hostert Ford Agency celebrated its 30th year in business. To mark the occasion, an open house was held at the garage, which quickly turned out to be a major event in the village, as 500 guests swamped the Front Street location, no small feat, as this number represented a good percentage of Mokina's population at the time. Within two years, it was time to expand. An addition was built to the west side of the garage, running the entire length of the building, increasing capacity in the shop, as well as making space for a new showroom. Less than a year later, the showroom was given a new ceiling and walls of knotty pine. While the concern was busy, its number of staff stayed a small and close-knit one, counting only six regular employees in the early 1950s. After 40 years of working in and for our village, Elmer Cooper passed away in February 1956 in what would have been his 77th year. As a gesture of respect, Mokina's businesses closed during his funeral. Just over three years later, Barney Hostert also crossed the Great Beyond at the end of 1959. After the passing of his father, a historic shift occurred when Harold Cooper took over the proprietorship, whereas upon Barney's passing, his share of ownership passed to his wife, Viola. There was no better candidate to take the helm, as the younger Cooper had practically grown up in the garage at his father and uncle's sides. He was regarded by villagers as an eminent Mokina businessman in the same way as his father, and in 1944 had been elected clerk of Frankfurt Township, an office he held for decades, not to mention the post in local civil defense during the World War II years. Still very much a family operation, his wife Myrtle would come to take over his position as bookkeeper. As the Cooper and Hostert Ford Agency entered the 1970s, business still marched forward, but Harold Cooper wasn't getting any younger, and neither were his countless loyal customers, who were starting to ease out of driving age. The many burdens of maintaining the company ultimately led him to sell it in 1974. Merle Cooper of Orland and Ralph Show of Frankfurt were the buyers, who kept the concern up for a year or two until they ultimately went bankrupt. 
the old garage housed various other concerns and ultimately burned in a calamitous fire in the spring of 1993. After having weathered two world wars, a Great Depression, and countless other changes over the decades, the flames couldn't erase the memories that live on in the hearts of countless villagers of this distinguished local business. Not only are the garage and its welcoming open doors so fondly remembered, but so too are all the Mokinians who called this place home. What a great story of yeah. you know, two people, you know, Barney and Elmer were both very active in the community, and not just as they the were. business owners, but they volunteered their time. They worked, you know, um, you know, 30 years as a, a district one, 159 director. Yeah. It's nothing to sneeze at. Really incredible. As well as the chamber, the lion's club, um, fire department for, for Barney Hostert. Yeah. He was involved just, with the fire department for so long. It seems that there was kind of a pattern with a lot of those front street business owners at yeah. the time, whether it be law enforcement or, um, you know, that's kind of where the community went to get its leaders in a lot of ways. That's a hundred percent true because, uh, back in the, in, in the days of yore, as it were, uh, the, the business owners in town, the, the front street business owners, they weren't just people who, you know, it's like, okay, I'm here to make money and get out. Uh, wasn't really the case. I mean, Mokina was where they lived. This is where they were raising their families. Um, they wore a lot of hats, um, and maybe in some ways because they had to, cause it was such a small town, but also because, yeah, this, uh, this wasn't just a workplace. It was home and it was a place that they deeply cared about and had the best interests in mind for, if that makes sense. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. They had a passion for it beyond just getting their paycheck and that. Yeah. Yeah. They were in the neighborhood. Yeah, definitely. Oh, sure. It's yeah. A, it, and, you know, a different time of people that, you know, really cared and uh, people that tended more seemed to go out of their way for their neighbors, for their friends, for right. their business, yeah. uh, business owners, for the customers and all that. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, a great story about uh, people that love their community and um, did a lot to make it better. That they did. And sold a lot of cars doing it. Yeah, that they certainly did. And uh, as you said, they sold the dealership finally in 1974. Yeah, nineteen. And then it only lasted a year. Yeah, didn't uh, didn't go on for too terribly far after that. So that was in the same building. They kept the same space that and. That is correct. Yeah, you have a kind of a brief idea of the tra like how the building has transferred after that. Yeah, yeah. So, so after that was uh, the firm that that bought the business from Cooper and Hoster. That was uh, as we mentioned, Cooper and Show, but they weren't around for very long at all. Um, they yeah, they went bankrupt pretty quick, and then this is a this is a good one. After, let's see. I'm, I may be getting ahead of myself. There was another car dealer there after Cooper and show. I believe they sold Ramblers. Any of our longtime Mokinian listeners will will probably know and be able to correct me if that's not 100 percent accurate. But then in the 1980s, there was a really interesting business in there that I think was a, a big product of its time. It was called Vandemoniums. And they customized vans. Yes. Yeah. Probably a lot of shag carpet yeah. coming out of there, huh? Yeah. You better believe That's it. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Vandemonium. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, I can remember in my childhood, the the business that was in there was, I think it was Feld, Feld & Co. or Feld Co. And they uh, sort of were kind of almost like industrial silk screeners like they printed flags and stuff like that manufactured flags and um the fire that happened there in 1993 that ultimately took out the building um started as it was just a very unfortunate accident uh there was an employee who was working with the uh the ovens or the dryers or whatever they were whatever you call them and i think he was working on an order once again I'm away from my 
files. This may not be 100% correct, but I believe he was working on an order of uh, fezes for the Shriners or something. Uh, embroidering them or, or, you know, whatever you do to the fezes for the Shriners. But he was working on them and there was, uh, there was a mishap with one of the big dryers and uh, that's what caused the fire. And it was quite the fire. It was a, probably the biggest thing that happened in Mokina in all of 1993. Half the town turned out including myself as a first grader. Did you really? Yeah. So you, did you remember it? You remember seeing it? Oh, or? I do very well, yeah. Wow. And there were fire trucks from, not just from Okina, but every community nearby was there. And um, there and was, go ahead. Do you remember how long, I mean, it was uh, empty? Like, did somebody rebuild right away or? If I remember right, they the building was rebuilt pretty much right away. Um. The building was completely destroyed by the fire, and, and what was left of it was was torn down. Uh, and then the the building that's currently there was built uh, pretty much right after, if my memory serves me correctly. And what's interesting is that's not the first building on that site to have burned down in a horrible fire. Uh, of course, Martin Hall stood there, which uh, burned in uh, 1912, uh, in in just as uh, catastrophic of, of a fire uh wow. and then yeah you can see why they built this building in brick yeah yeah it was I'm a little to avoid that maybe yeah exactly yeah definitely but yeah it's a lot of lot of local flavor attached uh to that uh, little piece of land and whenever i drive by or walk by which is very often i i always think of, of barney hostert and elmer cooper uh and their families and uh everything uh that that they did for Mokina. And I uh, think we could use some guys like them again nowadays. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and they weren't just selling people's cars that they were driving around. You know, they were selling the farmers, their tractors and they were sure, you know, yeah. the livelihood. They're selling the milk guys, their delivery trucks. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. You know, it's um, played a major role in this, in this town. Yeah, they did. Absolutely. Well, great. Another uh, really interesting story. Yeah. Two great people. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you're enjoying our show, it would really help us out a lot if you would leave us a rating and a review, especially on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, as well as share our show with your friends and your family. There's a link in the show notes to Matt's blog article that this episode was based on. So be sure to check that out. If you have any ideas for a show or have any questions we can try to answer, please send us an email at mokinasfrontporch at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you and hopefully answer your question on the show. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time on Mokinas Front Porch. Mm-hmm.